This is Josh back with Cardboard Chronicles, and on this episode I'm joined by a very special guest, Jean, from Arena Design. Jean and her husband Earl worked for FLIR during the 90s and were responsible for all major sports cards designs under FLIR and Skybox. This includes popular inserts such as Jambalaya, parallels like PMGs, Rubies, Credentials, basically all the top cards that we all know and love today from the 90s were designed by Jean and her husband. Uh, she gives us an in-depth look at her time with FLIR and Skybox during the 90s and how she was inspired by different things like art and culture to create these amazing designs and also how the cards were actually created and manufactured. So it's a very detailed interview. We get an in-depth look into how these cards we all love were created and it's a really awesome interview. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, I'm really excited to have Gene on and this is going to be a good one. So tune in. And don't forget to check out howtocollectcards.com, a website I created dedicated to helping collectors of all skill levels build their collections. Feeling like you just don't know where to begin, you don't know what all these different things mean within the hobby, I've created this dictionary and I'm giving it away completely free. It has over 120 terms, all the terms that you need to know to get started collecting cards. We're also offering an advanced training course that is comprised of 17 different parts, everything from learning what cards you should be focused on buying for yourself, what cards are worth, where to buy the cards, when to buy cards to save yourself the most money, how to avoid different mistakes within the hobby that a lot of people make. Uh, it's just got everything that you need to be successful collecting cards, so please check that out. We've also got a bunch of new bonus content, and any new content that I create for the training course gets added for free, so if you've bought the course already, you're going to get all that new content, and it's free for life. I'm going to keep adding stuff to it. There's always going to be new content helping everyone. So please check it out. It's really extensive. It's got tons of great information. I think it's going to bring a lot of value to a lot of people. All right, Gene, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to have you on today. Um, so why don't you just start us off? Tell us about yourself and your background. Um, well, my name is Jean McLeod. I am um, a graphic designer. I worked at FLIR from 1990 through 2000, so for the whole 90s decade. Um, before that, I worked in Atlantic City, which is where I met Earl. And um, <clears throat> Earl Rena was a designer on a lot of the uh, FLIR cards. When we worked in Atlantic City, we worked on a lot of um, casino work. And so then after that, we kept in touch, we got married. Then I worked in-house at FLIR and Earl was a contracted designer at, for that same decade. Um, that's basically it. And we're still in business, we still do um, design. So why don't you uh, tell our viewers just like how involved you were with the FLIR 90s stuff, like specifically what, what maybe what sets and where you started and kind of like what the history of, of how that went uh, during the 90s. Um, well, as you know, during that decade, it was very different from the time I started till the time I left. When I started, we were probably doing six sets. So we had the basic FLIR set. Ultra was just about to come out. Flair hadn't come out yet. Um, so during that time, you know, by the time I left, we were doing 42 sets a year. It was very different from the time I started. Um, when we started, like I was very involved in all aspects of the cards. And then by the time I left, you know, we were doing the design. We, we were in charge of what would the card look like in the end. So we designed it what printing technologies were used, what, um, if we used illustrators, if we used outside art, you know, all that stuff. So basically what the card looked like, a lot of times the packaging, um, if I really wanted to do something special for a particular set, like we did with Flair, we did the clear packaging for EX, that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes we were involved in the marketing material, um, it just depended on the set and how busy we were at the time. So when FLIR hired you, um, they kind of, it sounds like they gave you a lot of autonomy to be able to, to do things the way you guys saw fit. Is that, is that how you, uh, is that how you remember it? Yes. I mean, definitely it, it got the more successful the sets were that we worked on, the less they, they got involved. Mm -hmm. So like in the very beginning, 
when they did ultra, I did not design the first ultra, the one with the um, marble on the bottom. But then I designed the Razzles package for them because they also had a candy factory and that's where we actually worked in the candy factory at the time and um, in Philadelphia until we moved to Mount Laurel. So once the CEO saw that Razzle package, he really liked it and he said, you know, I want her to design the next set, the next card set. So we started on the second year of Ultra and then it just got it was very well received. And then after that, we just got less and less involvement with the people internally. You know, they let us just pretty much do what we wanted. If, if, as long as we stayed on budget mm-hmm. and timeline, that's what they really cared about. Um, I would say the first set that I really remember being totally engrossed in was the um, flare set. The first flare, I guess that was 93, I think. I don't know when that was. Um, they came to us, the CEO and the um, VP of marketing came to us and said that they wanted us to do, we already had FLIR and we had FLAIR. I mean, we had Ultra. And so they wanted to kind of do a, a super premium. So we had mm-hmm. base set premium and he wanted to do a super premium. And they said they were going to be $5 a set. And I, they called Earl and I in and um, said, you know, what if, what would that look like if we did a $5 pack and we were like five dollars like who's gonna pay that <laughs> <laughs> and um so we looked at every aspect of that card of the ultra card that we already had done and we thought like we looked at the card stock so we looked at a much heavier weight we looked at the coating which was uv coating and and we eventually went to this liquid lamination um we looked at the line screen of the of the um, photos themselves so that they were much crisper. We looked at the packaging, um, all the inserts, you know, we looked at everything and we thought, yeah, by the time we put all this together, I think we have something that will be of value and that people would pay $5 to pack for. So we, and we also decided to kind of go in that, I, I have some of the original baseball ones like go in that really kind of um, the more elegant and we, we did the, um, the photos, how they interacted with each other, the background mm-hmm. photo like that. Um, and so we put out the first year and I, it was, you know, really well received and everybody internally loved them. So then every set that was added, we were trying to think like, what is the reason for being for that set? You know, we didn't want to just keep adding sets for no reason. So when we purchased Skybox, um, we tried to differentiate FLIR from Skybox products. So that FLIR was the more traditional sets and Skybox was the more technology design driven sets, kind of more fun to work on sets. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, what year was that? Sorry, the Skybox purchase. What year was that? Um, I think that was in 95. I think I wrote it down. So you guys were doing pretty traditional stuff with Flair and then 95 came around and you guys started to really take off with some some new stuff? Yeah, I mean, we were doing some of that stuff in the Flair sets. Yeah, absolutely. But by the time we got to Skybox, they said, let's differentiate them. And like anything that I tried to do in Flair that was kind of wild, they were like, eh, let's put that in all the Skybox sets. So... <laughs> Um, Skybox became the sets that were much more fun to work on. And when Marvel purchased us, I think that was in 95, um, we realized we had access to all those Marvel illustrators, which was a great opportunity, which is how we got into the metal set. Um, because upstairs, I don't know if you know, but we had a whole, um, floor that was entertainment cards. So they were separate from us. We were on an, on another floor, but they were they got to interact with the illustrators to get all the artwork. So I went up to them and I said, you know, is there, are there illustrators that we can use to kind of interject some of that into our set? So um, I got a list of like seven or eight illustrators and um, 
we started working with them. And I'll, I can actually show you a few of those. What I decided to do, because it was going to be, like we started with baseball and that's such a large set. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do was kind of, I don't know if you noticed, but there are two players in each of the sets that utilize the same artwork. So like I would get, we had photo editors and I would have them pull these photographs. So I'll just say, this is the photo. And I picked two photos that were similar. Mm -hmm. I would send those off to the illustrator, outline them, get rid of the backgrounds. And then they would send me back something like this. Like um, some of them were much more detailed, like some of these illustrations. Um, and they would utilize it for two. So once I approved like these sketches, they would then take it and digitally create the art. But these were all Marvel illustrators that we never had access to before Marvel owned us. So that's kind of how that set got um, created. That's such a fascinating thing at that time. Cause like, I mean, you guys probably knew it at the time, but um, I don't know if you could predict just how, you know, revolutionary some of these things you guys were doing, given like what was around in the early nineties and what started you know, coming about when you guys started? Did you guys know at the time just how um, like groundbreaking and revolutionary some of these technologies you were introducing would be? Um, I don't think we did at the time. I mean, I, Earl and I, like I said, we worked in Atlantic City. We did a lot of uh, high roller party invitations. So they had foil and die cutting and all kinds of the stuff that we bought to trade in cards. And so when I interviewed a FLIR, they saw my portfolio and they said, Hey, this, some of this stuff would be really, you know, stuff that we could really introduce to the card. So they were excited that I had that kind of a background. Hmm. And then, um, I would just was really interested in it. So I was always researching new technologies and new stocks, new, you know, fonts, anything that I could get my hands on. And we had the budget for it, which was fun. And, but at the time, you know, we, like I said, we were doing so many sets that I don't think I, I really had the wherewithal to stop and say, we're, this is really changing how trading cards are being made. You know, I just kind of did what was fun. And Earl and I were more art driven, like we were, have our art background. So that was really where we were coming from, you know, trying to interject some of this artwork, some of the fun into it and really looking at these two and a half by three and a half little cards as pieces of art. Yep. That's yeah, something that, that me and a bunch of other people talk about all the time is like early nineties, you basically just have picture of the player, you know, in the game, some border, and then you guys really brought in the art side of it. So like what, what artists were you inspired by at the time and, and what sort of like cultural aspects and I spent, you know, you're talking about like the uh, Atlantic city, the gambling, like what other cultural things did you incorporate? Well, in the 90s, I mean, we were very into music and so, and hip hop was really exploding at that time, like the early 90s. So, you know, I think we were very influenced by that. Skateboarding was really big. I don't know if you know Ray Gun Magazine that was designed by David Carson. And he was kind of using fonts in a really different way. And I really liked that. I think we were very influenced by a lot of magazines. And the other thing with magazines is they are temporary, just like the cards are not temporary, but it was immediate. So it was of the moment, you know, we didn't have to think, Oh, what is the shelf life of this going to be? Is it going to be, you know, 10 years from now, if I designed a, a can of tomato sauce that would have to look this, you know what I mean? Have the same kind yeah. of impact on the shelf 10 years from now. But we could look at it immediately because we were on to the next set within a month. So it is to me almost like a time capsule of that moment. And I, that's what was so much fun. I didn't have to really overthink it. You know, we could just enjoy it and have fun. Actually, I mean, we did do some re market research and I wanted to kind of show this on Flare. This was like something that we put together. I don't know if you could see. But like we took this to a trade show. Um, there's a there's a big trade show in Pennsylvania out in Fort Washington. I don't know if it's still going on, but at the time it was. 
And so we would do some market research there. And so like this was the current card and these were some of the, can you see that? Cause that's clear. Yep. Yeah. Some of these were, um, these were the options that we had up and obviously we wound up going with B. So you could see B there. That's awesome. Um, so we would do like, sometimes we would take designs and we would actually have them printed out. And sometimes we would just, uh, you know, in this case, because it was such a big set and it was well received the first year, they really wanted to do something, make sure it was, you know, we were doing on the right path right. for the next year. So, which is why we did this, but sometimes we would just do like five designs and we would have a meeting and we would say, this is kind of the one that we like, and this is the technology that we want to do and that kind of stuff. But did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, you did. Okay. Um, I think I've also heard you mention like Warhol and some like famous painters at the time. Is there, is there also some inspiration there? Oh yeah. I mean, Earl was really into pop art and I think you could see that in some of his cards. Um, yeah. Yeah. He liked Warhol and um, Lichtenstein and David Hockney and like all the pop artists of that time. Actually, you know, some of those cards are not always the most expensive cards because back then, you know, some of that stuff was really produced, uh, you know, much, it's just overproduced compared to the way it was by the mid nineties. Yeah. But like some of those cards were, the artwork on it was so much fun. And um, I'm looking for this one particular card. Well, here's, here's the hot numbers. Mm -hmm. which um, these, you know, I'm sure that they weren't as rare as what is out there now, but the, um, the artwork for this, you could see, I mean, you could definitely see the hip hop influence on that. And Earl actually put some um, of our kids initials and, and little kind of things in there that, that mean something to he and I, <laughs> that people don't really know are in there. Um, my daughter, actually, what year was this? This is 95. My daughter was born, I was pregnant at the time. And um, so he put her initials in into this set. That's I such think. a great story. Yeah. You guys snuck um, in some personal <laughs> touch into the cards? Yeah, he did that on a few sets. He would know more about that, but um, yeah, he, he did that on this set. So we kept a set of those for her. For sure. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, so, you know, I have to ask the questions and I have to jump into, um, you know, some of the more like popular, expensive cards that, um, that you guys designed. So I wanted to know um, from you, how involved were you in sort of like the, the introduction of like serial numbered cards, parallels, inserts, kind of like the new, not necessarily printing technologies, but like more of the, like the way that the sets were released and how they controlled rarity and you know, how it like eventually increased the prices in some of these cards. How involved are you guys in that process? Well, like I said, in the early nineties, we were more involved because there were so few sets and there were so few employees actually uh, working on the sets. But by the mid nineties, which is probably the time period that you're talking about, um, we had, a lot of people who were really passionate about what we were doing, who were really good at what they did. Um, and so we had a whole group of what we called sports information guys, but they were really what you would probably think of as uh, brand managers. And they would decide that kind of, that end of things. Like they would name the sets or we would, you know, some people would have suggestions or whatever, but they would put together their set. Who was going to be in the set, the seating ratios, how many inserts, that kind of thing. And then it would come to us. And then I would deal with the um, photo editors, the production people, the pre-press people to get it all produced to our vision. Um, as far as, like, I know a lot of people ask me, like, why wasn't Jordan in that set? If Jordan was in that particular set, that set would be so hot right now. And I know, like, a lot of that stuff was was um, determined by our contract with 
the different leagues. So like the NBA said, it wasn't just Jordan. It was any player can only be used X amount of times in a set. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was five. And if Jordan was going to be in the base set, which he always was, unless it was maybe series two, um, then we could only use him in three or four inserts. And maybe we had six inserts. So that meant he wasn't going to be in three, two or three of the inserts. Um, so they would determine all that, the brand managers. And, um, you know, they were restricted by certain things and people don't understand that, but it's just the way it was. I mean, even Michael Jordan had a thing in his contract where we were not allowed to show him with his tongue out in any photographs because that was to him that was his signature that was his thing that he was able to sell to you know the people that were paying him so um the nba would never approve cards that had his tongue sticking out that's like that. fascinating i didn't know that yeah it's pretty it's funny i mean we also did nascar cards and in that case every nascar driver they didn't have a players association like the leagues do every driver had their own person and they had their own restrictions and it, you know it's just you're dealing with contracts that you know you have to stick with them so yeah that's awesome that kind of did stuff. you guys know like kind of I'm, I'm kind of hinting at like the pmgs and the rubies and credentials did you guys know like at the time these cards were going to be so big in the future and did you give them special attention when you were, when you were designing them or how did that go? Um, <clears throat> well, like on the PMGs, we were spending a lot of money on the base card. Like I said, we had the illustrations and then once we had the illustrations, we had each card was etched to that illustration. It wasn't like one common etch and then each card could just go through it. Like each card was etched to that card. Like actually I could show you on baseball. Like here, you could see the etching on that. That's like the the illustration in the background would have et been etched to that, you know? And so it's, we spent a lot of money on that. So once we got to the parallels, um, we said, let's try to utilize those same dies, not create all new dies. And do something you know that you would know as soon as you open that pack you would know this is not like the base card you know you we really wanted you to know that you got something special and so i don't know if you could see but i have um my engagement ring is an emerald and so when we were picking the foils and i knew it was called precious metal gems i thought okay i'm going to do an emerald color because that was my favorite and then I did the ruby kind of to match that um but did we know that they were going to be that hot I mean no we were we were just by the time it hit the market I, I was already two sets in to the next thing you know what I mean like it was it's it was just like fine by the seat of our pants yeah well, how do you guys feel about it today then? Like just given maybe the price increases and just some of the excitement around them in the last few years, how do you guys feel about, you know, what you, what you accomplished back then? And, and do you guys feel, you know, proud as you should that you've created something so, you know, popular and, and loved by the community? Um, I'm definitely glad that people appreciate all the work that we put into it. Cause a lot of people, you know, like I said, it was a group effort and a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into these things. And I'm, I'm really happy that people still appreciate them 20 some years later. It's great. Uh, um, have you, do you <clears throat> pay attention to the prices at all? Like on my channel, we talk about kind of like the investing side of cards at all. Is that something you ever thought would happen? Just like these crazy, price increases and is that something you guys ever thought about or cared about um i am aware of it because people email me all the time <laughs> and love you don't hey did you see that i mean when when the the green jordan card went for sale i got a lot of emails about that and i'm floored by it i mean it's great i think it's great for the hobby it's great i'm you know, for a while, I didn't hear anything about trading cards. I'm glad they're coming back and they're, it just seems like the hobby is stronger than ever. So I'm happy about that. 
how do you guys feel about uh, Panini and the way that they're designing things? Do you, do you feel like, um, you know, you could bring something to the table at the time uh, back when you were designing that they're not doing today that you wish they, they should, or like, how do you feel about Panini and their, their current designs? Um, well, the thing with Panini is that, you know, when you don't have competition, you know, I hear that they, that all these leagues have gone to a single source for their trading cards. And I, I just find that odd because, you know, with something like this, that's what sparks creativity when you have competition. I'm not saying that they're not being creative because I, I really, I only see some of their cards. I don't know. I don't see as much as I used to because we used to actually open up cases of competitors products to see what they would look like and to see what it was like to open up their products. Um, but I do feel like, you know, maybe competition would, would spark some new ideas. I did think, you know, I, I've been looking at the upper deck, um, retro stuff and, you know, I'm kind of like, if I was designing cards now, they would not look like what we designed in the nineties because it would be, like I said, it was almost like a time capsule. So I would be looking at what's current now. What are, I'm sure there's new technologies. I'm sure there's new stocks out there. I'm sure there's new fonts that you could be using, but they're recreating the stuff that we did in the nineties. So I, I kind of feel like time to maybe move on and do something a little bit. That's interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I never really thought about, how you guys weren't involved in the FLIR retro and they kind of just like basically copied it, right? Yeah. I mean, they own the names, I guess they're, you know, that's fine. I just feel like if I was going, even if I was going to recreate the EX set, I think I would probably take it a step further. Like, just, you know what I mean? Like rather than just redo it. But ha Has Panini reached out to you at all? Do they, are they aware? Like, do they have they, have they tried to reach out? Um, we've actually reached out to them over the years um, because I do know a few people who work there um, who or who did work there over the years. But, you know, they say, oh, we have somebody in-house or whatever, and you know, I understand that, so that's fine. We'll just have to revolt as a community to get you to do like, it'd be cool if you could at least do like a, you know, like a comeback set or just like a, a special edition design or something, you know, that'd be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Kind of like I mean, how, like in the shoe world, I know that they'll bring back designers to do like one specific shoe, like collaborate on a specific uh, project. And then, you know, it's like a temporary thing. That'd be kind of cool. Yep. I mean, I wouldn't mind even getting into other areas of um, like girl and I, talk about getting into sports other sports design you know like you were talking about sneakers or um i've seen basketballs that are like limited edition basketballs and that kind of stuff that would be fun to get into now that we're thinking about these cards all over again it's um it is a great it was a lot of fun to work on it's a great industry it's a, i mean sports who doesn't love sports a lot of people are really into them and the people who are collecting the cards treasure them. And as a design, a graphic designer, usually your stuff is thrown away. You know, it's like packaging and it's so temporary. So it was nice to work on something that was going to have such longevity. Right. Yeah. Um, so what were some of the sets maybe that uh, you feel people overlook today that, that you guys really liked working on or that you still enjoy today? Um, I would say, well, you know, Earl and I talked about this and we have different ideas, obviously. He has his own sets that he liked, but I really liked Circa and that was not, you know, I'm not saying it wasn't well received. I just have not heard anything about that over the years. Granted, it's not basketball, it's baseball, but I really like that set. Um, in fact, I pulled one of the inserts out, this Access, and I thought this, when we worked on this, I really liked this set, like, because it was, you know, I kind of looked at it like a mini magazine mm -hmm. where we were trying to get you as much information about the player as you could. It would be kind of, 
you know, we look at, we try to look at the player as the hero on each of the cards. And in this case, I thought that that really did that well, like just gave you a lot of information and just a lot of fun to work on that. But, you know, I understand that, that might not have been seated very low. So people don't yeah, care the, about it. <laughs> the thing that uh, kind of always bugs me about cards is, um, if it's not like worth a lot, people generally, you know, don't pay attention to it. Or even if the design might be better, like if it's not, you know, rare and it's not expensive then it just doesn't get the notoriety. So from your perspective, it's kind of interesting to hear, you know, that you guys almost like treated them all equally, right. And how you design them and how much care you put into them. But on our end, it's like 99% of our attention is on, you know, the high end stuff, the expensive stuff. How, how well, does that make even, you feel? Like when you're talking about the PMGs, the base card with all those illustrations, that's what we spent so much time on. And then, you know, we changed out the foil for the PMGs and didn't right. overprint them. So to me, you know, all our time and effort went into the base set. And everybody always talks about the PMG, which, you know, I totally understand because of the seating ratios. But yeah, I, I agree. We put a lot of effort into certain cards that nobody cares about. <laughs> But the, the payoff on the, the effort in the base set is definitely like recognized in that, you know, you put all the effort into the base and because the base is so popular, it's pushing up the prices of those uh, parallels that match it. That's true. I should and think. The, the base, that 97 Metal Universe, the base set of that is really taken off recently. Really? That's funny. Well, that's like the good. Jordans are, yeah. the Jordan's pretty expensive now and like people are appreciating the set and like, you know, all the space backgrounds and all that kind of fun stuff. So it's definitely, it's picking up for sure. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I mean like on the, you know, like on, on EX, when we first got purchased or when we first purchased Skybox, EX was already existing. It was EXL and then they had Emotion and those were kind of um, the two sets that morphed into EX. And so, like, I don't know if you know, at the time, we got some flack for some of our designs, like, like the metal set. Like, people externally and internally were like, you guys are a little bit crazy. Like, you know, you're stripping out the backgrounds, you're putting them in these weird situations. And, but I thought, you know, we have all these other sets that show them on the field doing exactly, you know, it's kind of nice to have something different. So looking at it now, people are like, this is great, but that's not what everybody was saying at the time. So when we first got EX, it, I don't know if you remember, it had that um, uncoated stock border and they were navy or green or burgundy. And so the first thing we did, actually, I think I have, I have one of those, is the first year that Earl and I designed it, we did this to it. So we took it and we put foil on it and we put the plastic and the, and I think the people were like, okay, so you flare eyes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we, we did, we added all the glitz and all the stuff that we like to do to it. Um, and at first I don't think, you know, maybe the people who really liked the traditional first set were like, a, but after a while, you know, we just kept taking it further and further and then getting rid of that border, trying to really eliminate, trying to do that floating card feel. And then by then people really liked it. So, I mean, yes, I think our style is, has a certain style and it has a certain audience, but, um, you know, it was fun to work on. We, we did what we liked. And in the end, there really aren't any sets that I would say you know, I don't, I don't still like when I look at them. Yeah. You guys know how popular the 97, uh, EX stuff is like the credentials and all that. The now and future. Yeah. Just like, I mean, yeah. Like the, the uniqueness of that set is it's just, it's incredible. Yeah. Oh, and I'm, I'm glad because that was a lot of work to get yeah. to that set. You know, like I said, that, that one I just showed you has that border and to get rid of that border, I really had to work with printers to make sure that, you know, they weren't going to fall apart. And it, it was logistically a lot of work, but I think in the end, I really was happy with it. 
and you know Earl and I just we put a lot of time and effort into it so I'm glad it's all paid off in the end. Can you talk about the 97 credentials technology? I, I'm, I'm not very good with like the printing technologies, but it's like the plastic and then you have like the, you know, like the foil on top of that. And then you have like the almost like paper feel of the player themselves. How, what was that like designing that one? Um, that one, there's like, there's probably eight printing technologies that go into making that one card. We had to print on the paper and foil on the paper. And then we die cut that. And that was actually on a, um, believe it or not, like a crack and peel kind of paper. So you would, it had like a sticky back already. And then we would print on the plastic front, print on the plastic back, foil on the front. And then they would, there was a jig. I don't know if, I mean, I don't have a sheet to show you, but they had like holes created in in both of the sheets and they would peel off the back and actually put it on a jig and put the two together hand piece the two together so that the paper would go over top of the plastic in right like in the right position so the fact that they came out (laughs) as well as they did is is amazing to me it's um yeah it was a lot of hand work for those cards I mean, it's, it's, it definitely stands out and it's like we as collectors can really see like the detail of that compared to just, you know, um, you know, like base cards and stuff that's printed pretty regularly and printed in high volume. If you're making something that handmade and that specific, we can really tell the difference. Well, and like, you know, I was, I tell people like, they're like, Oh, that Jordan card is this. And I say, well, look at the whole set because I mean, I didn't really look at a Jordan card and say, okay, let's really pay a lot of attention to this particular card. Every card in that set got the same amount of attention. Um, And I don't know, it's just funny. Sometimes when I talk to collectors, they have a certain um, idea of what they think went on. And when I tell them what really was happening at the company, they're like, you know, I don't know. They, they find it, I just find it funny. There's, there's just stories that I've heard that are like, Oh, that's not true. Or, Hey, how'd you know that? Like what, do you have any specific stories that you're, that are on top of your mind? Um, well, people always ask me about when I first started, um, I'm not sure who the player was, but he had the, the bat with the sing with the, um, where it had an expletive on the bottom of his bat. Who was oh, okay. Base, a baseball player. Yeah. And um, there were like five different versions of them trying to cover that up. And I said, well, they said they did that so that, you know, people would be chasing after it and want those cards. And I said, no, actually, like the first time they covered it up, they just put a black box over it and printed over it. But you could still see it kind of through it. So then the second version, they had to go back and do something else. And then it just, it just kept getting changed for a specific reason, but they thought it was, the reason was like more sinister. <laughs> like right. we were trying to get more money out of people, but it, it really wasn't that it was more technical <laughs> than that. So That's like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I just have a couple more questions and this one's kind of a tougher question, but do your best. Uh, what sort of like legacy do you guys hope to have, um, you know, going forward with what you guys have done in the nineties? Hopefully legacy. (laughs) I said it was a tough question. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, I really never thought of it as a legacy, but I'm glad that people can see the effort that everybody put into getting these card sets out and how much, you know, how much we enjoyed what we were doing. And, you know, I'm glad the people who hung on to them have a value in it, like, you know, a real monetary value to it. Uh, I guess that's about it. I really don't know as far as a legacy. Well, I, I appreciate the humble response. You don't have to, you don't have to brag anymore if you don't want. Um, no, I, I just, the reason I ask is just cause like, this this interview has been really important to me because I feel 
you know, none of this would have been possible. The stuff that we collect, all the things we're all excited about without what you guys did. And I just thought it was important to, you know, give you guys your, your proper credit and, you know, give you a chance to explain things. And I thought it would be really great for the community just to hear directly from you guys. And, um, that's, I was just, that's, that's just from my perspective. Like we were, we just love it. And, um, really excited to like be able to tell you how much everyone loves it and stuff. So I thought that was important for me. I really appreciate it. That's um, <laughs> Do you guys have, Some of what, this, what do you, sorry, go ahead. I mean, I, I think some of the sets that, that are most successful are the sets that Earl and I worked on together because I was in house. I worked in a different way that than Earl worked. So he worked out of his office. He was able to really get into the design of things, a lot of research of designs. I was into the technology, um, kind of taking his designs and putting a spin on it. So like I did bring one, one of the um, jambalaya because Earl designed that. And he, when he came in with this design, it was on paper. Like, you know, he didn't have this, uh, the stock. And I had this stock in my office. And I was like, I think that would be really great on this lenticular stock that I have in here. And I think that the combination of those two things are what makes this card, what, I mean, one of my favorite cards. So I think that that, you know, if there, is anything that I they think about like that I would like people to know it's kind of like it was a group effort to get everything and you know like I think the Jordan card in this I love the photo that was chosen for that and you know what I mean so it it was yeah, yeah so that kind of thing. I think having you guys you know together and working as a close group it can't be understated just to how like well done they were and you know kind of what I'm, what I mean by that is like a lot of times you can kind of tell it's like more of like a corporate feel design, whereas you guys, it feels more personal and it feels more like your style as opposed to, you know, mass producing, you know, refractors and game Jersey autograph cards where they all kind of look the same. Like we can tell the difference in terms of you guys working together and giving it that personal touch. I'm glad. I'm glad you could see that came through. Well, you mentioned game jerseys and that's kind of where it, ended for us like um that was more in the late 90s and i left in 2000 right after having my, our second child so um at that time we were owned by roger grass and um so we were no longer owned by marvel and everything started to shift so it became game worn jerseys and autographs and so we had a whole department just on that that never even existed before. And so all the money that I used to put into the cards and the technology and, and all the fun stuff that I liked working on was going into game worn stuff and autographs. So that I think really took a shift. And so I felt as though for me to leave at that time after having my child, I thought, you know, things are really changing anyway for me as far as what i got to do that was really a lot of fun so i thought it was kind of um i don't know what i'm sure uh, does that stuff hold value did that hold its value that stuff the like game jersey autograph stuff yeah i mean that's like all that people want these days that's like all it is i mean there's like <clears throat> the community that i'm a part of is more you know you're kind of area with the 90s and like the the more like design focused stuff but in general, the, the popular stuff is definitely the game jersey autograph type stuff. Yeah. So, you know, that, like you asked about Panini, I mean, maybe they can't put a lot of, they put all their effort into that, which is what happened at Fleer at the end anyway, too. So. But don't you feel like you could probably bring some design flair to that restriction that you have with the jerseys and the autographs? Isn't there, don't you feel like you could do a better job is what I'm asking? Well, I don't, I don't know that we could do a better job, but we could definitely have fun trying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you guys did like a collaborative Panini set of like some Jersey autograph, I think it would just blow off the shelves. I feel like that would be so awesome. Well, it'd be fun. It'd be fun to work on it. So let me, let me work on that. 
the world yeah. needs that design. Um, <laughs> is there anything else you wanted to touch on? Maybe any other stories you might have or cards that we missed that you guys like that I didn't touch on anything else? There's probably a million stories. Um, well, I did bring a few of my favorite cards. Not all of them are, you know, super valuable, but I mean, this is one of my favorite, this golden touch. Um, I just really, this, this was a stock. Like normally we would foil a gold, but that gold in the background that Matt was actually the, the stock itself, the paper. And I love the striations in it. I just, there's just something I really like about that card. Um, this is probably a card that's not, I don't, this was early on. This was EX2000, but like this card to me, like the plastic in this was super thick. I don't know. Have you ever held one of these cards? I've never seen that card before. Nope. Really? I, oh I do. I do basketball. So some, uh, sorry, okay. some of the baseball stuff. I don't know. <laughs> so this is really a super thick plastic, which was really hard to die cut, especially in this kind of like intricate die cut. And then we had an etched foil of the field in the background. I just really like how that card turned out. Um, this is one of Earl's favorites, and he did this, this Dunkin' Donuts. Nice. Um, at the time, we were not sued. I have read, that's one of the things, like you had said, what are misconceptions. I did have read that we were sued by Dunkin' Donuts, which we were not, but we were sent a letter to cease and desist, which didn't matter because it was already on, you know, everything that we were <laughs> going to produce was already on the market. So, um, did, you know, I used to go to a how design conference and, you know, it's just designers getting together and you get to hear people speaking. And, um, a after the conference, there was always, uh, an area where people who had printing technologies or, paper companies would go and I met this company that that did this um, laser die cutting so um, we had worked with them to get a portrait laser die cut out and um, I really liked how that turned out um, so then we bought it into molten metal and then that company also did the metal cards in that set um, and that was another difficult card I know that like it doesn't seem like the metal cards in that set are what people are really after, but those cards were the hardest cards to produce in that set because after every ink that laid down, so we would lay down white and it had to go through an oven to get adhered onto the metal. And then you would lay down cyan and it had to go through an oven. Like each layer had to be cured onto the metal. It was, it was You're baking crazy. cards. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy but you know i thought it was worth it in the end i really like those cards oh um, i feel like people watching are like which cards did they design i like you guys pretty much designed everything right am i like understanding that correct pretty much everything from that era with, that was fleer or skybox was you guys um all the sets that we've been talking about today but no not every set like at different times during that 10 years we've had other designers um, nobody was there for that entire period, but after we bought Skybox and we decided to differentiate them, I would say it, starting in 98, 99, somebody else worked on like the ultra, the flare. We did 97, but we didn't do like the 98, 99 stuff. Um, so no, not every set, but all the sets that we've been talking about, like EX and metal flair you know I mean, these the, are these are all the best ones like the stuff you're showing me is like the most popular inserts jambalaya platinum portraits pmgs credentials ruby these are all like the cream of the crop so like i think i'm just hitting it you guys like anything that mattered in that time you guys had a hand in it well i'm glad we were able to <laughs> work on some fun stuff <laughs> taking the humble route i like it um awesome any, any last stories anything else um uh, but I can think of, let's see. I kind of made some notes so that I would, I tend to ramble and as you <laughs> see, I did do that. So, <laughs> um, 
I'm sure there's stuff that I missed. Oh, this was the set that I was looking for early on that, that I said was kind of like just a lot of fun, maybe not worth a lot, but like this is the kind of artwork that Earl did that I really liked. Um, these, a lot of color and, you know, just that kind of stuff. So. I'm definitely going to try to get Earl to do an interview after. I think uh, it'd be cool to follow up with him. Yeah, he has a totally different take on things because he didn't have to deal with the day-to-day -day workings <laughs> of getting the card produced. So, yeah, once it, I mean, we went on press checks. Oh, one thing I, one story I will say is that um, Earl was on a press check one time and you always see it in the movies, like people call up and say, hold the presses. And that's kind of like what we had to do for him. He was actually on press and um, we had, it, Ultra was called Elite. It was Clear Elite. And we had cards produced, like everything ready to go. We had packaging, logos, everything was done. And then I guess Donruss came out with Elite. Like, just as we were on press with our elite. So we had to change elite to ultra and we named it ultra because it was the same amount of letters as elite. We could just change the logo. It was, you know, it was an easy change and not to change the, um, the deadline of when we had to get everything produced. So that was, that was quite a, an experience. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to hear from your side, like, you know, kind of the, the deadlines and the actual like technical execution of all these things. And we just, we just get like releases and sets coming to us and we just assume like, Oh, you know, someone in the background made all this, but it's interesting to hear the, you know, kind of the execution side of it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was my life. The execution. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have like crazy deadlines and a lot of hours and was it just a crazy time? It was, but you know, I was young. I was young at the time, so I could do it. I didn't have kids yet and I didn't mind putting in the hours. It was, it was fun working on it. Great. Yeah. Um, so do a quick plug for your, what you guys have going on currently and talk about arena design and what you're working on and how I can help with that. Um, well, you know, since we left FLIR in 2000, we've had our own design company and we do a lot of packaging, branding, logos, um, all kinds of stuff like that. And like I said before, like now that we're getting back into thinking about these cards, I think we're going to try to go into a direction to get a little, maybe a little bit more sports um, stuff into our portfolio again. But yeah, we do anything print. We do websites. You know, it's a business. <laughs> awesome. Do you guys get any sort of like kickback from these increases in the nineties? Any, any sort of like, mm. no, I wish <laughs> like, uh, you know, like, you know, TV shows that get syndicated and stuff. Those guys, those actors get some of that money back, but I guess it's a little different with cards. Yeah. No. And in fact, I mean, we, at the time we used to get sets of everything that we designed. Um, but not the numbered sets, obviously, because all those numbered cards had to go into the packs. Right. So that makes sense. All stuff that's really gone through the roof. We don't, we don't have any of that. You're not hoarding PMG greens. I wish. And if I had them, I don't know that I'd be hoarding them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jean, uh, I really appreciate the time. This was fantastic. Uh, yeah. Again, just, I loved all this conversation. I think it's really good for the hobby and it's going to be good for everyone to, to hear kind of the history of it. And uh, I'm excited about this one. Okay, good. I'm glad it was fun. All right. Thanks. All right. See you, Josh. Thing where we did like some, um, some market research, they would come back and they'd say, we do the market research and they want gold foil. And I said, well, that's because they've never had, that's because what gold foil is what they want now. I want to give them what they're going to want tomorrow. So, you know, like I always said, uh, Henry Ford said, if I asked them, they'd say, I want a faster horse. I want to give them a faster horse. I want to give them the Model T, you know, like, so you have to think differently. So I'm wondering if you came out with a set, because even though everybody wants jerseys and autographs, but if you came out with a set 
that didn't have that but had something else to offer, I wonder if they would want that. You know, like everybody wanted hollow foil once I put hollow foil on a card instead of gold. You know what I mean? We did look at competitors and that we would buy a case. We would all sit around the boardroom, every different like group. You know, we had the production people and us and the photo editors and the marketing people and the brand people. And we would open up, we would each get a box and we would just start opening them up just to see what it was like to feel, you know, what did it feel like to open up the competitor's product and what did it feel like? And then we would have our case that would, kind of be the competition for that mm -hmm. we would say what does that feel like compared to that yeah. and that's why sometimes in baseball we would do something like like we did with this is the pmg like we didn't have pmgs in baseball we had this and then we realized opening the case you know what it really we need like somebody else was doing a numbered something so we said let's do a numbered parallel and that's kind of how mm. PMGs came about in basketball compared to baseball. So we would open up the products and we would, you know, look at competitors. And I mean, that was, I thought that was good that we knew what was going on. Cause otherwise I really wouldn't, I wasn't a collector. I wasn't a card collector. I collect a million things, but not cards. And um, so that was, but they don't have that cause they don't have that competition. They don't even need to see what other people are doing. and. Um, compare themselves to it this one yep right the second one but then i found out see this one here yep they did they, that in 2003 well guess what i wasn't working there i hadn't been working there for <laughs> three years oh, what they took that card they must have found it in my office when i left that's exactly what it looked like in 2003 well i found it on the internet i'm like what when was this done because I, you know i wasn't paying attention like i can't even believe it they're Did you know that like, there, there was a, a LeBron of that one that you just showed me that sold for 160000 because it's a one of one. Oh yeah. It's like a gold. It's kind of like goldish. You've seen like that there's like gold and blue of those two. <laughs> yeah. It's like his gold credentials, one of one. It's like 160 grand. So I'm like, I haven't been there for three years and they're still using my designs. It was dry. It was like driving me crazy. Like in my little circle, you guys are, are pretty, uh, you know, um, you know, you're like legendary. So I just, I thought it was, you know, fun to have you on and tell you that. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it.